Zombie Tech. <sighs> Welcome to Zombie Tech, a forum for engineers, scientists, and inventors to ponder on the technologies needed to survive the inevitable zombie apocalypse. She's Eddie. He's Whisker. And uh, who do we have this week? Today we have Paul Clark, otherwise known as Mon PJC, and you're from the UK. That's right. I'm here. Huzzah! <laughs> <laughs> So where where does Mon PJC come from? Oh, that, that's very old, actually. Um, when we first got the internet, uh, we had to come up with a sort of a username. Sure. And uh, as it is, you know, it's like you put in lots of different usernames, and none of all of them seem to be taken. And it was just one that happened to stick, and uh, used it ever since. So it's and, like a random smattering of six letters that you. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome it's well just, although it's pjc just, it's just I guess. memorable sure i guess pjc is, is is not so random because it's paul j clark that's but, right yeah. but the mon might be slightly slightly yeah. random all right well fair enough fair enough yeah so, i mean and, and it's also easy just to remember then because otherwise you keep changing your username and you never remember it years later yep yep that's a very good point um so <laughs> So you are a electronics design engineer at right. uh, EBM. Is it Pabst? Can you say it Pabst. like that? Pabst. It's Pabst. Yeah. Does it stand for anything? Um, if you actually look at well, it's a German company. If you actually look it up, it means the Pope. The Pope. Um, but it, yeah, as in the Pope. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it actually has nothing to do with him at all. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what the German uh, meaning behind it is. Um, well, that's- <laughs> that is terribly funny because you guys make like motors and fans, and yep. and that relation to the Pope is I, completely <laughs> random. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, originally Paps was um, a fan manufacturer on their own, which ah, okay. uh, go back many years, and EBM, which is is German for something, I should probably be told off for not being able to remember it. It basically <laughs> means electric motors. Okay. And they 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 basically they joined together at some point, so it's an amalgamation of the two names. Gotcha, gotcha. And um, do you? Okay, so the whole company I, again is motor and fan manufacturing. That's and right. I saw in a bunch of your biographies that you supervise from the very beginning of the process in terms of conception all the way to even tech support. Um, are you still doing that? Is that still? Yeah, because the. Um... Because we've we've got fifty seven subsidiaries around the world, uh, of uh-huh. which the UK is one. Mm-hmm. Everything's designed and manufactured in Germany from the fan point of view, mm-hmm. and then we do the high level assembly in the UK, oh, okay. and uh, which started off you know just putting plugs on the ends of fans, um, but they've now got a design team. So we we actually we're a small design team, mm-hmm. even though we're under a very large company. Mm-hmm. And we do, yeah, we, we supervise everything from meeting the customer, right in the spec, right the way through to sort of helping them test it if they can't get it to work when it's finished huh. and doing tech support afterwards. Now, that's pretty neat because a lot of the engineers that we talk to are very mm, specialized in one area. You know, they don't, like, once the ideas come to them, then they may troubleshoot certain er- parts of the spec and then or the schematic and then send it off to somebody else um but you guys actually end up going from beginning to end well quasi end i guess um yeah i mean it, it's because it's a small team and so we work very much like a, a small company and mm. um, so you have to deal with everything from beginning to end mm-hmm. Heart- i've worked at places where you are you only ever deal with the circuit side and you've got other people doing the pcb layout and the manufacturing and and all that other side for you hmm. uh, and you're just a small part of the chain it's almost kind but of it's, sadistic, it's nice though. in a way oh go ahead it's it's nice in a way but it's it's also it can be quite difficult because you you haven't got many people in your team hmm. so you haven't got the, the in larger teams it's easy to bounce stuff off mm-hmm, mm-hmm. ideas and problems and solutions and, and looking for things mm-hmm. uh, but you know where we are in the uk we've only actually got three electronics engineers and uh, oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> wow as you can see you know one, that's one of the reasons I, I talk to people in the community right right just to yeah get but another i mean it's good that 
locally, I mean, there's not nearly a, uh, as many uh, around that could get bit and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, convert. But, you know, but the danger in that is that if everybody needs an electronics engineer, then they'll end up flocking to those, like these three, and then that'll attract more zombies. Right? <laughs> I guess so. Right? So, I mean, there is, there is some risk there. If you had a whole team of like 50 electronics engineers, right, then at least only a few would be picked off and like, you know, Paul would be prepared. He would be like in the center and not, or maybe even gone, like maybe even, you know, to the, to the apocalypse bunker. Or maybe what you need is pseudo engineers. People that look like engineers. <laughs> oh, that would decoys. work too. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, Feed them off first. Uh, like uh, shop dummies or something. <laughs> Just uh, dress them up as engineers and set them out front. <laughs> That'd be great. I don't think they'd have to be shop dummies. I've certainly worked with some that look like that anyway. <laughs> Do you think zombies... Uh, uh, just inherently understand that engineers run slower than other people so that they should, you know, chase the engineer specifically? I, I, don't, I, think there's a, I don't think engineers move slowly at all. Um, oh. I, I've certainly seen how quickly they move when there's free cakes available. <laughs> um, uh, free we, food. Uh, we presented at a <laughs> IEEE meeting uh, a couple weeks ago. Yep. And uh, yeah, the engineers there definitely moved very quickly to the pizza table. That's pretty good pizza. I certainly don't understand, I, I certainly don't understand how, how they managed to take over the world because they, they can only walk. They don't seem to move fast at all. It just seems, you know, you, you've only got to pick your pace up to get out of their way. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> now, speaking of the community, uh, Paul writes for... Uh, A bajillion blogs. Yeah. Like... All right, I, th I wrote a list down here. Engineer blogs, you've done uh, a bunch of blogs for them. Design yep. Spark, you're still writing for. Yep. EE Web, you're still writing for. Yep. And you also have your own blog. Yep. And I'm also doing stuff for Element 14. Ah, I got to add that to the list. Element 14. Goodness gracious. So, <laughs> so why... Um, why do you like blogging so much? Um, I, I don't know. I sort of got drawn into it. <laughs> um, it actually goes back to before Design Spark started. Mm -hmm. uh, through EBM, um, obviously, we, we sell a lot of fans through RS and Farnell. Mm. And we were at RS, and um, I was complaining about the lack of uh, information that was available mm -hmm. for small teams and engineers like we're in and you haven't got the other people to talk to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And before they then came to us, before Design Spark was actually launched, and said to us, hey, we've got this beta website we're trying out, new community and stuff like this, and similar to along the lines to sort of Element 14, but they'd already beaten us to it. Mm -hmm. And did you, do you want to come on board? I think we were first of 500 uh, users to actually use the site before it went live in the July. So it started from there, and the community manager then, Lee, uh, pushed very hard for us to sort of, we wanted to get content onto the site rather than just launching a, 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 an empty website. Sure. Because nobody wants to go to an empty website with no information because then no one wants to put information in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we were starting to write blogs, and he was sort of generally encouraging myself and Peter also works at EBM. Uh, to write blogs, and that's where it really started. Hmm. And uh, it sort of progressed from then on. I mean, yeah, because at this point, it almost, it's almost like you write, uh, what, like a cup, a few, few a month, or? It's about one, one a week. week. One a week, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just with all the different locations. Do you, yeah. do you find that it's actually helpful in terms of, establishing a community that small teams can go to? What do you mean places like Design Spark? Yeah, Design Spark, EE Web. I mean, just all of these different blogs because like you were saying, you know. You, I think it can. I think, I think one of the things that I certainly found when I looked for projects and even now when you go out and you look for example projects mm. is you go to hobbyist sites and you're not always convinced that 
they know what they're talking about, even though they do, a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, we definitely don't. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you're actually looking for somewhere that sort of gives you a li little bit more information and somewhere where you can ask questions. Mm. So True. places like Dave's forum with the EUV blog mm -hmm. is, is a great forum for it's there's lots and lots of engineers on there talking about stuff and you can get lots of information from there and you get useful information so these communities are good I have always said to them though it, it would be better if they all had one site sure rather than half Ten a dozen different billion. sites yeah yeah sure. yeah I, mean, sure. I, I think in principle they see the idea but I don't think corporately any of them would ever join up together to make one site sure, sure. but um you know that they're, they're reasonably good at each uh, there are pros and cons for every site sure. i mean uh, dave and chris and lots of the other guys that are online like yourselves complain bitterly about some of the, the downfalls of the sites and i think they work hard to try and correct those mm -hmm. uh, and try and make them as easy to use for engineers mm -hmm that there's ultimately that goal in the background that they're, they're commercial and they've got to make money. Right. And I think that's actually probably why a lot of sites stay separate so that the money doesn't have to go to all of the different uh, people. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, but, but as engineers, we don't really care. I mean, if you, if you go on Element 14 and you read about uh, a particular product, it's not going to make you buy it from that site. If you can get it cheaper from RS or DigiKey or Mouser, you'll still buy it from there. True. True. So I, I don't. I think they know that, but they're trying to forget, trying to pretend it doesn't happen. Hmm. It's an it's an interesting dilemma. <laughs> it's an interesting. <laughs> I so, think we should start spreading rumors that all of the uh, like competing community sites uh, that their owners are zombies secretly living in human society. <laughs> What, like, what's that Dave Jones do? would be a great spot to start because what's I think we could convince do? people that Dave is a zombie. But Dave doesn't even know what a zombie is. He gets kind of grumpy, especially when things don't work right. <laughs> so you mean like if he doesn't get enough human flesh? Yeah, well, that's why he has so many forum ranty. members. He needs to have that many for lunch. <laughs> Dave is going to... I mean, you notice how people disappear <laughs> like, from those what? forums, right? Never to be seen again. If you ever wanted a way of being mentioned on one of on the Ampal, I think you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, David. <laughs> so it, now when it comes to, I'm very interested in, in he, this idea of engineers in, at the workplace using these communities as resources. You know, there's, a lot of like NDAs that engineers have to sign, and uh, there's IP and blah blah blah. So, like, how much can people actually end up? Well, that, that's the big that's the big issue is mm -hmm. is is how much you can actually discuss online mm -hmm. about infringing your own patent or IP. Right. Uh, it's great if you're a hobbyist; right. you can just talk about whatever you like. Right. Uh, ask the questions. And, but yeah, you, you've got to think when you go on there and you, you sort of ask about, you know, a particular latest chip or you, you tend to have to watch, and read what other people are writing, hmm. uh, hope, try, you know, try and gleam information from the application notes and the data sheets and, and, and the hobbyists. Or pretend like you're a hobbyist and, and yeah. kind of tweak yeah, the I, question. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other way around. Yeah. I, I don't think I'll get away with that though. It's too obvious where I am. Uh, and certainly on these other communities, on, on these communities, there are, uh, we have, I know there are people on there that are our suppliers, uh, our customers, and also our competitors. Oh, so sure. It's, so it's even doubly diff more difficult because. Yeah, I mean, I can't go on there and start talking about the, the latest fan that, you know, generates anti-gravity particles or something like that. anti and, ooh, ooh. Do tell. <laughs> And because uh, they're all going to go, oh, what are they doing? You know, they're, they're obviously designing something new and, right. you know, going in a particular way and can give them a tip off. Right. Uh, so it, ha it has to be has to be kept. Gosh. Kept what you're actually saying. That's frustrating. I mean, it can it can be. Could you guys at least have like uh, inter team or intra team con um, 
communication, you know, with other uh, double E teams around in different locations or what have you? But you, you say that. I've actually worked for a, uh, a company where they had 130 engineers worldwide mm -hmm. and they had their own internal forum, which oh. was closed. Oh. And they were actually able to discuss and ask questions. So, for instance, they say, well, we've got, you know, we want to develop the next, uh, we're developing a power factor controller. Sure. And they'll say, you know, what chips are other people using? And other people can kind of come back freely and discuss it. Oh. Because it, yeah. And you can I've freely discuss the ideas. Our own internal private, uh, it's essentially, it works just like Twitter, but it's uh, inside the firewall for us. Uh, we, we have. haven't used it for anything, but yeah, we have it. We do? Yeah. <laughs> Show us how much I know. <laughs> I just talked to yeah, Whisker. I mean, yeah. He's sitting next to me. So. Yeah, well, yeah, I do all the, the IT and <laughs> infrastructure for this stuff. So, you know, I, I've gone through tool after tool after tool. So I know exactly what Paul's talking about when he says that they've got their own, like, private internal systems. Mm -hmm. I've heard uh, some uh, software engineer uh, at, at uh, various companies have told me that they have their own internal IRC servers. Oh. In their companies. That's handy. Yeah, yeah, so they can just sit in an IRC channel uh, for each dev team has their own channel, and then they've got, like, you know, uh, uh, group channels where uh, uh, department heads will hang out in just to coordinate. Well, that works. It, it's certainly a good way. The more people you can involve, the better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, certainly if they're from different sites. Right. I mean, as I said before, you know, we've got different sites around the world, I and mean, we're, we're free to discuss whatever we want with the the other sites mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't necessarily talk to each other at an engineering level but certainly at a technical level there's lots of discussions about new products and new ideas and products that we're making gotcha. uh, and seeing whether requirements are needed elsewhere in the world gotcha gotcha now what's the easiest part about like designing your projects you know since the easiest you guys, part yeah well you know since uh, since you guys do like from beginning to end, you know, what, what do you find is the easiest thing to get into? Um, For you personally, get... I think. <laughs> <laughs> actually getting the job done. Um, <laughs> That's actually you know, a pretty good easiest part to do. I mean, because that, that yeah, takes I mean, a lot it's... of time to get to that point. Yeah, I, I, it's not just speaking for any one company in particular, but, you know, the, there's the whole spec writing point, uh, the making decisions, the agreeing funds and hours and stuff like that, and that's, you know, dreadfully painful uh, to go through as a process. And mm. as engineers, we often sit there and think, you know, we'd just rather get the job done. Mm -hmm. and, and then at the end, you think, well, it works. Why do I have to spend all this much time writing an OMI for someone who clearly shouldn't be using this product? If they don't know, you know, how to wipe a mains plug. <laughs> so th there's the extremities, I think, are the worst, the paperwork in, certainly for me. Uh... But the, the actual doing the schematics, doing the PCB, doing the layouts, uh, building the prototypes, the testing and stuff like that. But that's the, the only way you can describe it is, that, is that's the hobby part of sure. the electronics. Sure. That's then wrapped up in the commercial world of uh, of all the what we engineers call nonsense. Hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> that seems highly that, that nonsense facilitates an entire livelihood. So, <laughs> but doesn't I mean? It's doesn't nice that, that that nonsense is there? Doesn't that seem? Yeah, I mean, if you rather... look at what Jason's doing, um, yes, he's having to decide what what specs he's going through uh, for the products he's designing. Most of the guys like him. Right. But the, the turnaround of their products is far, far higher than what most commercials are doing because they're spending so much time looking at paperwork and stuff like that. And yes, there is a reason for doing it. You, you don't want projects to, to fail and, and not to sell anything. Sure. Uh, and there are larger risks. Yeah, but I'm I think completely behind Jason ways of doing it. Uh, Jason Toddick, Toddick.com, friend of the show. Um, I think I'm, I, he's doing a, a great thing over there, keeping it small, keeping the turnaround quick. It's really good. So, isn't that incredibly inefficient use of engineers, though? Because you guys are, like, brilliant at, you know, doing all of the actual, quote, you know, what you, what you refer to as hobby work. Um, 
Shouldn't they just leave the documentation for somebody else? Uh, it would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Comments box I think... <laughs> to EBM Pepst. I think the, um, the issue is there is that when you're trying to just, it, sometimes it's actually easier to actually write the documentation yourself than it is to try and pass it off onto somebody else. Mm. Certainly for where we are, we're a small team. We can't support a large team. So you have to take on all the other roles. There's also the matter of if, when you're producing something that's going to be used by other engineers, you definitely don't want an, a non-engineer uh, being the middleman in between, you know, who made it and yeah. how to use it. I you guess know, that's true. An engineer is going to write a much better uh, instruction manual for it than some intermediary party. And that's certainly true for the stuff that we're doing is that they're going to OEMs they're not going to, you know, be sold on the shelves. Mm -hmm. So, for, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously, RS and Fano are set are different from that because anyone can just buy something from there. But effectively, you're selling into an engineering community, so you need to supply engineering type documentation. Sure, sure. So then, what's your? I mean, I don't know how much you can talk about in terms of your stuff at work, you know, like specifically. But do you have any favorite? projects that you've worked on while you've been there or actually you know in, in any of your jobs really um it's difficult to say because i've always said that the the products themselves are not not necessarily what's actually interested me mm. it's the to me it's the the problem solving sure. and the coming up with new ways of of doing stuff that uh, and knowing that you're designing and maybe building something that nobody else has considered doing before. So regardless of whether it's been, you know, measuring the quality of a, of a food substance or flying in our space or on, on the back of a Formula One car, mm. you know, it, we, we still have to go through the same process. Right. Zombie blood test kits. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think of what, now that you've mentioned zombies, I'm trying to think of what fans could do for zombies. You think you can make a fan that was power no powerful enough to blow them Big away? Big fan. Oh, yeah, easy. Chop them up. Really? That's yeah, easy? Yeah, they're already, they're already there. Slice and dice. Really? Yeah. Oh. Dude. Nice big jet engine-sized fan. Sucks the zombie up. Slice and dice. Pulls it out the back. Gross. Well, even the small compact fans that go back in the back of PCs, they'll they'll give you a, a nasty cut, and they're only little. You fans. know, I have got a nasty cut off of one of those. <laughs> uh, some of the newer ones have that hook on the end of the blade. That's right. The, the yeah, airfoil. those will mess your fingertip up. Ugh. Let me tell you. Yeah. So then, how? What would it take for you to, uh, to to hook up a a wall full of Fans that could either chop or blow. <laughs> it wouldn't be very hard at all. Walk, I, walk I, me through the I process. Mean, that way we know what materials we need. Well, I mean, from the EBM point of view, I mean, we do a, a 900 millimeter diameter fan. Okay. So, you know, I think you'd stand a pretty hard job. I mean, it's about three kilowatt motor, five kilowatt motor. Okay. I think that's on the back of that. I think you'd have a hard job just standing still in front of one of those, not alone a wall of them. Can we add spikes to it? Yeah, you got the balancing issue then. I would make an excellent metal funny. manager. <laughs> well, yeah, see, can we have but, it in pink? But you, <laughs> <laughs> but you also have to have a kill safe because, you know, somehow it's got to have a sensor that you're can human. Can it play MP3s? <laughs> it's... <laughs> Flight of the Valkyries while it's... <laughs> In interestingly enough, the, the new modern uh, AC fans uh, are not like the traditional AC fans. So if you're going to stick your hand in there, they groan and grind and, oh. um, you know, you could eventually burn out the motor. Modern fans are effectively large DC motors with polar magnets. So they've got intelligence built inside them to actually operate them. Oh. So providing you didn't break it in half or destroy the blades in the process. If you actually ram something inside the fan, they will actually detect that they've been stopped and they'll just turn their own power off. So they, they are pretty good at saving themselves. 
Well, well actually, one of one of the demos I actually do for for customers uh, at this level is to take a fan, which is I'm trying to think what sort of size it's about four or five hundred millimeters in diameter, mm -hmm. and I just grab hold of the blade before we turn it on, and you just power it up, and it just sits there, and it's just nudging and nudging, trying to pull the blade out of your hand, mm -hmm. but it's not strong enough to actually damage you because it's you know it's trying to not damage itself and it'll wait until the the obstacle's been removed before it powers up that's really good uh, if you get a zombie head stuck in there you'll be fine uh, on uh, <laughs> a pc that i built years and years ago uh someone stuck a little uh, popsicle stick in the, the the fan on the the, the power supply for the computer uh -huh. yep. and that stopped the fan in its tracks and eventually the fan melted out Oh. Uh, melted, caught on fire, <laughs> caught the uh, power supply on fire, right? Oops. Yeah. Wow, that all that just from a freaking popsicle stick? Yeah, just stick? from that little fan being having something stuck in it. You know what? That's going to get someone to like actually try it. Well, if the fans have changed now, so. But see, okay, so they're self, uh, what's the word? Self-preserving? -pres okay, the fans are self-preserving. fans. Zombie fans, oh. but yeah, can we, you can override that, right? In the event of a of a zombie apocalypse. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I mean, once the fans actually running up to speed, I mean, the the momentum and the inertia that's actually there is should, should it's going to take something pretty serious to to stop it. <laughs> Hordes of undead masses. <laughs> All right, come on, fans, you can do it. You can be the first line of defense. This, this is, of course, assuming you've gone past the safety regulations and decided that you can stick something bigger than a finger in a fan. Oh, oh true. Well, just take the grating off, you know, the... the. We won't have to well, worry about health and safety then, though, will we? Well, that's why I'm wondering if you can, if you can somehow program a fail-safe, you know, in terms of, like, if it detects that it's human, the fan stops, right? If it detects that it's zombie... Then the the fan like doubles its speed or something. Well, I think you're gonna have to properly spec out this uh, this uh. I'll leave the documentation to you. Ah, let me see. <laughs> I'm just I, I'm just. I think just if you found any humans that were still alive that were silly enough to sort of put their hands in a fan, do you still want them in the gene pool? True. Well, but you know, like for the ones that suck people in, you know. I want to see what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You got to be careful of those. You know, because if, if, well, I guess that's true, though. Gene pool is, is pretty important for after the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> I mean, save human lives, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> now, uh, you said, uh, I believe you were on Essex? That's right. All right. Uh, and you off, can actually understand me. Uh, off the coast there, <laughs> um, there's a guy named... Uh, uh, is this Roy? one of those American comments where you, you, you'll say, you know, or well, you're from England, you must know Dave. No, 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 there, <laughs> no. There's, there's a guy named Roy something or other, uh, but he has occupied for, like, since the late 60s or something, uh, a uh, old naval uh, weapons platform that they put down during World War II uh, to sort of defend the shipping channel coming in uh, out of Ex Essex. And right. uh, he has declared himself a uh, sovereign uh, country. Uh, they call it Sealand. And I guess it's right off the coast uh, from where you are there. I was just wondering if you'd heard of that, because that's a guy who might be good to have on a zombie apocalypse team. I know he doesn't live on the platform anymore. He moved back into town, so he lives, you know, he, just a couple blocks from you. That's fair. He seems a little nutty. Well, yeah, very <laughs> nutty, but, you know... <laughs> He owns a weapons platform in the middle of the ocean. True. I think, and, and it's up on giant concrete pillars up out of the water, too. So even if zombies could walk under the water, they're not getting up oh, that I've, thing. Yeah. I, I, I've not actually heard of him, but I've actually heard of this. Um, <laughs> he, he lives in town with you. It was taken, he was taken, <laughs> it was actually taken over by a pirate radio station. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, radio Essex. Yeah. Radio Essex. No, it definitely wasn't Radio Essex. <laughs> well, he, he called his radio station Radio Essex. <laughs> there is a Radio Essex now. It's definitely not him. Right. Um, well, <laughs> at the time, this is this is like, you know, the 60s or something. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not that old, though. But yeah, because um, we had Radio Caroline, um, which was an old trawler that was set up off the coast. Hmm. 
so that they can actually transmit into into the UK. Yep. So that they're outside the UK waters. It's pirate uh, radio pirate is so radio. interesting. So interesting. Yeah, there used to be a lot of pirate radio around in those days, in the 60s and 70s. You need to get them back. Yeah, I think all the uh, they all went off to be ham operators or something. Yes! Success! <laughs> Are you a ham operator? Um, when I was learning electronics, um, in 81, CB radios came out in the UK, which is the FM version. You, you guys got the, had the AM, didn't you? Yep. And there's, it grew largely in popularity, huge amounts of people using it. And uh, you ended up with lots of kids using it, unfortunately. And you do oh. sort of like 100 watts to talk to the girlfriend, only sort of 200 yards down the road. <laughs> and uh, play music and, and wipe out four channels either side of them. And FM <laughs> takes up quite a bit of bandwidth too, so. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of people started moving over to ham. And I had, because I was doing, I actually started electronics was about six or seven. Mm. And I was actually helping other guys or ham people who were becoming ham operators learn the electronic side. No. Oh. And I did go for all the regulations and stuff like that. And I did consider taking the test, but at the time I just couldn't see why mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. And we had a 30 meter receiver that we used to use. I used to use um I don't know if you guys ever had them, the Spectrums or the ZX eighty ones? Did, did they ever reach the US? I'm aware of them. Uh, they weren't yeah. really like around Dragon. here nearly as much. I'm a Commodore sixty four guy, of course. Um, yeah, well, we had the, the Dragon in the UK, which was a sort of a, I think it's a bit of a clone of the, the Commodore. Um, we used quite a lot. I think Roy Elson may have had a Sinclair uh, as his first computer. Yeah, and we used them to listen to uh, or receive. Slow scan, Ritty, and mm. uh, Morse. Cool. Wow. And we did actually get particularly sad at one point, and we actually managed to transfer programs from one spectrum to another using a CB radio over um, the air. Don't know if you're much wow. of a history buff, but man, oh man, is amateur radio important to re recent uh, uh, UK history? Because, <laughs> you know, holy crap, in World War II, the amateur <laughs> operators in... in uh, they were instrumental in helping. Yeah, what, well, you look up where EBM is and uh, where I work, mm -hmm. and we're in Chelmsford, the home of Marconi. Gotcha. Oh, cool. Yep. yep, Marconi buildings are probably two, three miles away from where I work. Oh, my gosh. Do you go there, like, on your lunch breaks? <laughs> I don't admire the building. <laughs> no, unfortunately, <laughs> it's, um, it's unfortunately in a very desolate state now. Oh no! Uh, a lot of the place is boarded up since the since they shut down. Oh wow! But the uh, Anglia Polytechnic or university we've got there has actually got a Marconi building that they've named after it, and they are literally across the road from where the old buildings were. Hmm. It is a shame. Yeah, and it's a shame that you're not a ham operator yet. You should totally <laughs> get on that. Totally get on it. Zombie apocalypse. Well, I won't have to sit in your regulations then, will I? Yes. But it's, it'll be easy. It'll I think Addy easy. just wants more uh, DX QSOs. Dude, that'd be excellent. Long distance Yeah, I, I think I just, I just didn't take it at the time because you know, I, I was a, a teenager and wasn't really that interested. Sure. I didn't see the need. And obviously we still had Morse in there as well. I mean, I could have taken the lower grade. Oh, that's but true. To me, it was always a case of, you know, either do it all and do it properly or not bother. True. And uh, I wasn't interested in learning Morse. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I can't say I don't have any interest at all because Whisker's kind of like making me learn it kind of sort of by listening to it all the time. But, yeah, I'm uh, not, I'm not a ham operator, but I'm slowly learning Morse, which is fun. Yep. I did enjoy listening to it. There's, there's a sort of a, a thing of sitting there listening, slowly winding in the sideband and getting the tone <laughs> just right. Yep. Yep. Getting through the noise. Yep. So, yep. Um, besides work and the awesome zombie sucking fans that you guys make, what uh, do you have any projects that you work on on the side, like as part of your hobby bit? When it you're not going to believe, and I get very jealous when I see these other guys on the internet. It's, they've all got benches and desks and workspace, <laughs> and I've I've literally got about I don't know about 
two, uh, you know, two foot by six inches of space in front of my monitor. Ah. That said, um, no, I don't do anything here. Um, luckily, I, I get given lots of dev kits to review. Yep, yeah, yeah. And uh, I get to play around with those. Sure. Um, as anyone who's been following at the moment will know that I've been playing around with the the Excel FPGA board. Okay. Which is a great little thing. And uh, Jason's, so, uh, yep. And uh, Jason's uh, LED matrix. Is this, with. is this that Tautic, uh and Zula yep. X? Okay, okay. Yeah, gotcha. that's the one. Gotcha. Yeah, because I'm doing a few FPGA blogs for uh, Element 14. Okay. So I decided, well, you know, I've got this kit laying around. Uh, a lot of hobbyists, from the point of view, want it. it, it you don't necessarily want to be building boards mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, and it's time consuming. So you know, well, you I've do it at that... work all the time anyway. So <laughs> yeah, um, so I mean, it's yeah. But it's I thought, oh right, we'll have a go at actually building stuff on breadboards. Yeah. So you know, I'm taking other people's dev boards and bits of kit, and I'm seeing what I can do with them. Right. I've got the Palio uh, M3PI little robot. Okay. Um, I've got one of those. I've got some XB transmitters and receivers. Sure, sure. Um, so I've got a, this year, I mean, previous year, I've just been reviewing individual object, individual kits. So this year, what I want to do is I actually want to write up blogs where they're actually being used and doing something interesting. Awesome. Should be fun. So it'd be the year of projects then. On uh, yeah. one I'm of your... Stuff. YouTube channels, I noticed that uh, it looked like you were playing with some sort of a line following robot. Yep, that's the one. That's the little robot from Polio that uh, Arm gave me. It looks like you got it up to a really, really fast speed towards the end. Yeah, I, I can't remember. I think it's about a meter a second it'll do. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Top that's speed. pretty good. I don't think I've ever seen one go quite that fast before. Pretty it's pretty good. impressive. There are faster ones. Um... I think from what I can remember, this one doesn't actually meet the maze-solving speed that you'd actually need to do if you're doing proper competitions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually quite get up fast enough. Wow. But, um, yeah, it's, it certainly shifts. Uh, Embed actually do a race competition where you actually sort of program them to sort of try and get the maximum speed out of them. Oh, cool. And uh, did you tweaking win? the PID and I haven't actually been involved. It's where I saw it at um we have a new electronics trade show. Ah, oh, I see. And that's what I saw. I saw that at last year, I think it was last April. And uh, they they hadn't actually released it, it was just an ARM prototype. I say ARM, it's embed guys in Cambridge. Ah. And they developed it and I think they've given the design to Paleo and now made the boards. So I do some bits and pieces with Embed, and uh, they gave me one, and I was able to review it. Awesome. It's like uh, adult Pinewood Derbies. That's right, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of like <laughs> your... Geeks. Right, well, yeah, exactly. Um, in terms of your reviews, how do you put your boards through their paces? Like, is there anything that you um, want there's to make sure they can handle, etc.? Yep, there's... Um... I actually did a 101 to four uh, dev kits on, I think it was engineers blogs. Okay. And I look at kits and I say, I want to be able to get them up and going in 30 minutes. Oh. So that's, you know, there's, uh, you imagine Christmas, you open the box, you get something out. You, you don't want to spend 45 minutes making it work. Right. Um, or a couple of hours. Right. And I hate the idea of getting a dev kit and spending three hours downloading the IDE <laughs> and right. then, you know, pouring through 400 pages, to, you know, to get it to blink an LED. Right. Uh, it's got to be able to sort of come out the box, put it down, really simple guides, easy links to find on websites, well explained. Um, but then importantly, you know, once you've got through the, the examples, is to be able to then go on further with the dev kit. Hmm. There are too many one-trick ponies, which they, they just do a function and a demonstration, and that's that's all they will give you. Mm -hmm. And from a dev kit, certainly from the point of view, is if you're a hobbyist or if you're doing this from a commercial point of view, hmm. 
you're buying this dev kit because you want to review the, the, a particular chip or a processor or a technique, you then want to be able to move it on into your design. Right. Yeah. I think the real judge of a development platform is whether or not there's a uh, a podcast uh, with <laughs> some chick that doesn't know what she's doing trying to figure out how to use it. I think that's a really like important uh, uh, quantifying factor of the whole you know vibe of the thing. Yeah. Well, I don't think that's any way to speak about Jerry. Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is helpful if you've got videos and stuff to to help you along. But I think, that, as I say, there's there's too many kits I've picked up where you've got no extra I/O on them, or mm. no extra facilities you can take them any further, or you get given you know twenty thousand lines of code with which are heavily <laughs> commented, but you just still can't understand one end of it to the other. Right. And you think, you know, I'm going to spend weeks trying to understand this and I want something that's easy to understand. Right, right. Huh. So do you, do you have one that you enjoy, like that you've picked up, but enjoy, enjoyed so much that uh, you would continue developing with it? Um, in a way, yeah. I mean, the XOR is definitely one so. uh, that I, I like using. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's got a lot of flexibility on it. That you've, it's very simple and easy to use. Mm -hmm. um, Leaf Labs. I don't know if you come across them, guys. They're, they're the maple board. I heard about... I think I read that um, yeah, the, in your they've got a, Yeah, they've got an STM32 processor on that. Mm -hmm. And it's currently the only dev board I've picked up with an STM32 on it that's I've found actually usable. Oh, okay. They've got a really, they've got a very, very good Arduino clone interface for it mm -hmm. to use, mm -hmm. and it certainly not makes the microchip uh, chip kit clone look poor by comparison. Gotcha. But I've been very impressed with that one. Gotcha. It's got a lot of features on it. Cool. Well, that, that actually lives in my bag. Oh. And that actually that goes like that's doing as many miles as I do every day. I can force to work. Because it is there, I can use it at work or I can use it at home. Because I, I use that over an Arduino. Oh, well, I that works. Prefer it. Now, yeah. uh, like, do companies end up reading your reviews, and have they ever replied to you or changed des design from your uh, reviews? Uh, yeah, I mean, most of the reviews I do, I I'm normally getting the equipment from them directly anyway. Mm, okay. Um, or through one of the distributors, so they probably know I've got it. Mm -hmm. um, I always try and give them an opportunity if I find stuff that's particularly bad. Sure. Uh, to try and make amends. Um, I am just one engineer, and I sort of go back to them and say, look, maybe I've got this wrong. Maybe I don't understand it. Mm. Maybe I can't find the stuff on the website. I'm just not looking right places. Mm -hmm. So I give them the opportunity to come back and sort of point out, but generally I won't change what I've written, certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, other people have gone away and changed stuff on their websites oh, to hey. stuff easier to find. Good for you. Um, yeah. So you're so, like a nice version of Dave Jones. No offense, Dave. I think Dave is very nice. <laughs> Dave's a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait, first I'm a zombie, now I'm a bastard. No, I'm, we're, we're just, I mean, in the, the sense the, the that you give them the, the only... chance yeah. To to respond. Now the only the only difference is is you actually get to see Dave throwing Sorry, him, Dave. Uh, a pit kit free every shoulder, whereas you don't be me. <laughs> and you know, I I I get very very frustrated. There's yeah. actually stuff I've tested where I'm refusing to write a blog for it oh. because I found it absolutely so awful, and I've gone back to him and said this is actually atrocious. <laughs> That's great. And yeah, there is a lot of that kind of stuff <laughs> out there too. I mean, for every good product, there's you know hundred bad ones. Yeah. And, and there is one on Design Spark if you want to go and have a look. Uh, I won't say their name. Um, but I went back to them and I said, look, this is absolutely rubbish. And, you know, this is, you know, one of the, this looks like a dev kit that, you know, somebody from high school's done. <laughs> we, we need Pauls and, and Dave's and in the world to, oh, you know, keep people yeah. honest. I agree. And, and the really nice thing was is that uh, TI came back and, uh, oops, and uh, they said, we don't care. So I Really? Yeah, they didn't care. So they got a really nasty review anyway. Oh, good. Was it Ocean <laughs> Strategy? <laughs> Did Paul Cristoforo <laughs> sit on their board? 
But that's, I mean, who would be so stupid as to say, well, we're going to send this out for someone to review and then tell them that we don't care about the quality of our product. I mean, like that, that just, that defies I think logic. It, I think it depends who you end up going back and speaking to. Um, that I so it could be I, ego? I just went back. I think I just went back through the normal, uh, I hate to say this, marketing routes, and uh, they didn't care huh. uh, if I'd have been speaking to someone inside or an engineer or something like that. They probably would have taken more interest. Sure, sure. Well, that's why you know the the whole equal opportunity employment thing is a brilliant idea, but not so much when it also applies to zombies. Uh, when you hire zombies in your marketing department, you're going to get this kind of crap. <laughs> Well, I'm just going to state for the record that, you know, that the people we have in marketing are not zombies. <laughs> just in case anybody's have you listening. Had you tested them? <laughs> <laughs> she, put it this way. She makes my tea, so I'm not going to say anything bad about <laughs> her at all. <laughs> I, am, I am still in you awe. You run out of that, questions? No, no. I'm, I am still in awe that, um, I, that you... You guys have to go from beginning to end in your projects. Like, I'm going it's beginning. It's different from what hobbies, hobbyists are doing. Well, yes and no, though, because a lot of hobbyists have, like, templates to work off sometimes. Like, some people, they have, you know, okay, so say you want to make an audio amplifier. There's, like, a bajillion audio amplifier circuits out there already, and all you really have to do is adapt it somewhat for your own needs, Right. So well, you don't, well, you're not. I, well, I would say we probably do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I, I was uh, taught by a software engineer, but one of the best tools was copy and paste. <laughs> and you know, as, as a hardware engineer, it's very much the same. Uh, we deal with okay, we deal with a large number of fans. Yeah. There are temperature circuits. There are humidity circuits, uh, and and CO two and different types of things and. They don't really change. That they're not really massively different. I guess that's true. But we're we're working from building blocks. Yeah. I mean, yes, those building blocks evolve. I mean, in the five years I've been at EBM, some of our drive circuits that we use for driving the different outputs and our input signals, and we've come up with new quirky ideas and ways of doing them. Mm -hmm. But they move between our designs, mm. and we reuse those ideas. So it's just a case of where we have one, two, three, or five of them fitted in the board. So you're kind of like a sensor guru then. Because I, I, you know, when I think of fans, I think of, all right, well, you plug it in and it goes. When power is on, it goes. Otherwise, it's off, right? But yeah. you're, you're mentioning like temperature sensors, CO2 sensors, like. Well, I, the whole world is going green and uh, we're trying to reduce energy consumption and, and noise pollution and all these sort of things and ah, i see it's there are there are tons of people listening to this who have stayed in a hotel somewhere who have been kept awake all night by the fan rattling in the kitchen down below them <laughs> and you all know what i mean yeah and it's now a case of you know just educating people uh we're now designing and developing fans and regulations are changing so people are having to change these new energy efficiency fans hmm. so that they use less energy, they're quieter, and because they're inherently a, a DC motor with intelligence inside them, mm -hmm. there is a controller built inside them. So it's very easy to change the speed. And I, I think it's, what is it, if you reduce a fans or a motor speed by half, reduce its energy consumption by something like seven apes, Wow. So it's a massive it's a That's massive a drop lot. off. Yeah. Probably buckets. So there's there's real benefits from dropping the speed off. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and when people design fans in, they design fans in that are over spec. You, you wouldn't design something in that's under spec. You always end up putting a fan you always right, end up right, putting right. in a fan that delivers more airflow than you need. Sure, sure, sure. So if you can back the speed off, you get what you want and you save energy. Sure. And this is, of course, very useful to the context of this show because a lot of a lot of times we're talking about how do you rebuild after some sort of disaster? And if you're going to rebuild, you want to rebuild in an efficient fashion. 
And yeah. uh, having this sort of technology around uh, makes it much, much easier to do that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it sounds like uh, there's a lot of fans out there of Paul's work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's you a couple of questions. That was, that was horrible, Mr. <laughs> there, there, there's a couple of questions that we like to ask every guest. Okay, wait, but I have. Tech. And she I, always interrupts. I, I always have one other question. Okay, question. Um, do you think you're going to stay working with fans and uh, the like for the foreseeable future? Or do you think you might want to move on to something else? I, I don't see any reason of uh, moving from where I am. Mm -hmm. I enjoy what I'm doing. Okay. Good people. Not going to be starting any pirate radio stations on naval weapons platforms? <laughs> no. Eh. No. Strangely not. Radio, radio Mon PJC. Yeah. Huzzah. Yeah. <laughs> Complete with animated figures. <laughs> that would be, be great. awesome. That would be awesome. All right, are you done you know, interrupting maybe now? Maybe if people started paying me for my reviews and my blogs, then uh, you know maybe there might be a career change. But no, I'm still just an engineer. Sure. Hey, not just an engineer. Engineers we need engineers, awesome. so I'm all up for that. Plan. They're awesome. Yeah. Especially people who know how to do everything. Especially when there's only, would you say, three? Three? What three? Three in the three? area? Yeah. At our place, yeah, we've only got three electronics engineers, yeah. Yeah. That is just mind-boggling. I mean, how many, okay, and like. If I were that company, the, I would like change the words in your dictionary around just to make it more difficult for you to blog efficiently. What? You know, a little bit of uh, subversive, you know, editing of like, uh, they could put up a company firewall that changes his research results from Wikipedia searches and stuff like that, just so he gets things wrong more often. That way he can never uh, succeed in a career as a, as a blogger. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I get it. Yeah. Clever. But, okay. But you're, you're, good thing you're not his boss then. <laughs> there's, there's information <laughs> to be given to the masses, Whisker. Oh, well, yeah. For the people. For the for, people. Yeah. Right. And I think that's, uh, that, that's something that I try and push is that engineering is, is, is di very different from some other jobs. Um, mm. Different people in different companies won't necessarily talk to each other. In the same level, at the same level, right? Whereas engineers will. It's about passing on and building on right. what other people have done, right? Right. For the and, good. And and your blogs really do do reflect quite a bit of that. So, I know the com That's engineering sad. community. Thank you for your efforts. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I'll, I'll cancel that memo to your bosses about the misinformation <laughs> thing. I was I was mistaken. <laughs> Mistaken about the misinformation. <laughs> oh, Whisker. All right, all right. So we've we have got an a IT couple... department. I, I can assure you most stuff is filled. <laughs> we, we do have a couple of questions that we do have to get to. Right. Got just a couple okay. minutes left here. I will. See, I was trying to try and make this l longer than Dave's one. D than Dave's. How long was Dave's? <laughs> uh, since I built the podcast <laughs> clock, we're much better about staying on time. Well, I felt so bad because some. I used to I used to go way way past the mark and then they got hungry and then I I felt bad. So <laughs> I don't want you guys to get hungry. Um so <laughs> So what three tools would you bring to a zombie apocalypse bunker there in the middle of the ocean off of Sussex? I'm or no, Essex. Paul comes I just prepared said Sussex. being Essex. a regular listener. Yes. Uh, no, funny enough. Um, uh, sonic screwdriver. Okay. Um, a hat. A hat? Yes. Why? Well, you would have noticed. You would have noticed I'm bald. Yeah. <laughs> but... Can't let all the heat get out. It's, it's more like getting burnt while I'm out there trying to fit all these fans on the side of the building. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Wait, why would you get burned by fans? No, by the sun. Oh, no, the sun. Oh, the, the oh, sunny. Oh, I see. No, oh, engineers okay. don't uh, go out in the sun. Oh. <laughs> They're vampires. Engineers yeah. are the real vampires. So engineers exactly. are the sexy and 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 brooding uh, yep. uh, folks. We I eat see. Pizza and drink. You know, we drink. Uh, you know, eat pizza and drink jolt. Yep. Yep. With a little bit of Mountain Dew on the side. Yep. Right. Okay. Okay. So a sonic screwdriver, uh, hat. hat. 
What kind of head? It's got to be something that looks particularly bad, isn't it? <laughs> like, are we talking fedora? You know, so you can like... A what? A fedora. You don't know what a fedora is? I don't go outside in the light. <laughs> <laughs> Indiana Jones style. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You I, mean think, the I think Paul's more of a bowler kind of guy. Really? Yeah. It's a gentleman. Yeah, it's got to have a, got to have a big rim. So Sombrero. when the rain, when it's raining, it's got to run off. <laughs> you have a little mini gutter system. Yep. Awesome. Okay. All right. But then your hat. But then your head won't get well. <laughs> I just wear it all the time. <laughs> Cowboy hats. Maybe uh... he needs like a small umbrella. <laughs> oh yeah, and an, an umbrella hat. Like they Inspector do make Gadget. Those. They've you know? got the uh, the, the multicolored headband, and then the four risers, and then it has an umbrella on it. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's something you'd expect a, an electrical engineer to think was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. So a hat, and then what's third? And I'm also thinking um, uh, an electrical cattle prod. A what? Cattle prod. Why? Cattle prod. Electric one. Z for, for keeping the zombies off. Oh. It's non lethal. <laughs> 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 it just. <laughs> uh -oh. They're non lethal? <laughs> cattle prod is non lethal, yeah, but <laughs> it's, it's already dead, so. <laughs> 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 Man, these jokes are going way above my head today. No, I think they're going under your feet, honestly. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, okay. So <laughs> I apologize for my sense of humor. No, <laughs> that's okay. Whiskers laughing a good laugh right here. <laughs> um, let's see. The top uh book you would bring. You see, I've been listening. Everyone's bringing the, the art of electronics. Right. So we already um, have like two or three copies of that. Which will make, you know, great firewood because that's a thick book. <laughs> it's horrible. It's and, and for holding doors open. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Quick, put the I, art I, of I electronics think... by the door. <laughs> Nobody seems to be bringing any VHDL books. So I think I'd have to bring mine. Yeah. What's HDL? V VHDL. What's VHDL? Uh, sort of a quasi programming language yeah. thing for Very hard, uh, difficult FPGAs. Language. Oh, I see. Yeah. I haven't quite gotten into FPGAs yet. Awesome. But they sound, well, so they're awesome. But they, yeah, they do sound kind of awesome. But logic gates scare me in general. I, so. I've, I've, actually, I've actually stated this, and uh, people have criticized me. I've, I've said that. VHDL, I think, is sort of the most purest language I've come across. Oh. Um, the ability, the things you can do with VH, uh, with with FPGAs, are, are, just, are, are just great and fantastic. It, it it blows my mind the stuff that you can get up to and get away with doing that you just can't do in a micro. Hmm. Yeah, because everything happens like now, which is all really happening cool. at the same time. Yeah, hmm. and it's just really bizarre when you're looking at the code and you're thinking all that code's running at the same time. Yeah. That's when great. I get to it, I think I'm going to really <laughs> like them. But uh, for now, I'm enjoying microcontrollers. So Instantaneous code. Bam. And it's hardware as well. Yeah. Ah. All right, it's Paul. Proper. Wait, wait, there... wait. I have another question. Huh? One last question. One last question. Um, What is your zombie apocalypse survival plan? In general. Um... Wear a good pair of trainers so I can outrun them. <laughs> Stiff upper upper lip, right? I mean, that's the that's the general <laughs> plan out that way, right? I, I did actually consider coming on here tonight and speaking with a plum in my mouth the whole way through, being mm. more stereotypical. But what the what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? You just lost her ball. <laughs> oh dear. Um. <laughs> Well, it's, it, it, you know, if ever we watch American programs and you have English people in them, and it's just so proper English, it's just unbelievable. Uh -huh. And uh, I do consider trying to do that, but I think I could keep it up for an hour. <laughs> um, yeah, that stereotypical, posh way of talking is just like you talk to real people from England and it's not how they speak. Well, English people exactly. can say anything and because of their accents sound brilliant. 
Really? Yeah. I think so. I, I think I know too many English folks and Welsh folks and Cockneys and whatever to know that that's definitely not true. <laughs> well. You talk to any footballers and, and suddenly that accent doesn't sound intelligent anymore. <laughs> I, I think that um, come the apocalypse, if I've got my, my cattle prod under one, ha- one arm and uh, my VHDL books under the other with my hat on, mm-hmm. my shades... And a good pair of sneakers. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're going to be able to touch me. Awesome. Awesome. Mon PJC, the cattle prodding, I mean, the zombie prodding, hat wearing, VHDL <laughs> programming superstar. I dig it. <laughs> All right, Paul, is there uh, anything out there that you'd like people uh, to be aware of? Uh, uh, blogs, Twitter? I think everyone knows where I am. Uh, I know you're going to put links yep. underneath this. So that'd be good. You know, send your feedback. Let me know what you like, what you don't like. Um, I'm always interested in what people's, what other people think when they've tested stuff. Cool. To see where I've come up with the same ideas. Cool. That sounds good. Yeah. All right. And so, Out of time for this week. Yes. It's been <sighs> fun. Not terribly productive, but I laughed a lot. So, <laughs> hey. <laughs> That's okay. We figured That's out a way to get fans, like zombie chomping fans, into the, the zombie bunker. Zombie chopping uh, fans with spikes uh, that are pink and play MP3s are definitely a step <laughs> in the right direction. Yeah. And All having right. watched a zombie film, I don't think you got anything to worry about. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, you can find this podcast every week. On Thursdays at yes. zombietech.tv. Correcto. We're on Twitter at TYMKRS. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.